So my introduction is short. I'm a, a lucky guy. I'm a, a geriatric psychiatrist. I have a half-time practice. And then uh, I've, I've been uh, fortunate enough to be involved in private research, mostly dementia trials, for about 10 years. And that's half-time. And then on Tuesdays, I work at Brook Army Medical Center in their uh, consult service and the medical surgical units. So I'm a lucky guy. But uh, on to the topic. Uh, this is uh, tricky. I was uh, given this assignment some months ago, and uh, the request was, could I do a presentation on hoarding? And, of course, when I went home that day and my wife and I were talking about the day, she said, so what is it they, that they want you to talk about? And, and she said, I said, hoarding. And she said, oh, well, why don't you just have them come look at your desk or, or maybe the garage or, or the back of your car? So I guess my wife has my number to a degree. Uh, this past weekend, we were lucky enough to be out in, in Palo Alto, California, uh, which we were told is, is one of the most affluent and wealthiest cities in the country. And uh, coming down this very fashionable avenue was a elderly man, quite disheveled, uh, um, quite unkempt, layered in clothes, pushing a, a shopping cart that was just Overflowing is, a, is an understatement. It was just past uh, capacity, filled with plastic shopping bags. And, you know, it was just such a, a startling contrast to this uh, very affluent, wealthy place. And, of course, the thought was, why is this, this poor soul collecting these plastic bags to, to this enormous extent? My hunch is everybody has been touched by this condition. It's, it's not a diagnosis as yet. And, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's shades of gray, isn't it? The, the expression, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Uh, I, I know many people who collect things, um, at what point does collecting things become hoarding things? So all sorts, all sorts of questions here. I think probably at the end of this we'll be left with more questions than answers, but that's always a, a good thing. Uh, so very long introduction. This was quite a learning curve for me. I, I, I tried to do my, my diligent homework. And... A little confession here. It's, it's also been a, a little bit of a therapeutic thing for me, too, and I'll, I'll talk about that at the very end. So if we could just advance to the first slide, please. It's simply entitled Hoarding, and there's a subtitle, The Diogenes Syndrome. And, and I'll, I'll get to that interesting name in just a wee bit. But... Uh, Let's start with a, a dramatic headline from a British newspaper a couple of years ago. And, you know, here's one sentence, but it speaks volumes, doesn't it? Loner dies buried under self-made trash tunnels. So here's a, a very unfortunate end to a very isolated individual whose residence or home is so trash laden that to get from point A to point B he has to create tunnels and ultimately they crush him. I mean it's almost incomprehensible isn't it? Almost incomprehensible. Well here's uh, some small examples. Um, now when I first saw this picture the part of me that loves food said, golly, this is well stocked. But, but maybe one might say it's extremely well stocked. And my hunch is if we looked at dates of expiration here or gave it the sniff test, uh, we'd probably get dramatic new information. Now this, uh, you know, somebody just asked me a minute ago, is that a real picture? It is. Although 
I actually find it to probably not be consistent with what we're going to talk about, because while there's certainly a lot of cats in a room, it's extremely neat, isn't it? It's beautifully neat. In fact, how did it get so neat? Now, now we're kind of moving into heavy-duty hoarding, in, of which one component, there are five components, is domestic squalor. Of course, one just glances at this picture and, and, and asks the question, where does someone use the restroom? And this one, we won't linger here because this is before lunch, but another component of Diogenes syndrome besides domestic squalor is extreme self-neglect. And, and what's, what's the, the expression? Picture's worth a thousand words. And then we'll kind of close out here our little, our little video jaunt. Again, lots of cats in a pretty vacant room, but uh, in addition to lots of cats, what we see is uh, lots of feces and uh, clutter. No doubt there's infestations here probably of several types. So... This is sort of the, the tip of the iceberg, the ugly tip. You know, we've seen it in the papers. We've heard it on the news. I'm told, I, I don't get out much, that there's actually a couple of reality TV shows now about hoarding. So uh, here it is in front of us. And, and, you know, it's really pretty startling because this is 2011. And we've had dramatic medical advances that have extended our life expectancy 30 years. And, and with that extension, the expectation, particularly in a, a first world country like uh, the United States, in which we have first world medicine, the expectation is not only will we live long, but our quality of life will be top notch. We'll live well. Yet here are some poor souls that that are quite on the opposite end of that spectrum. Now, for those of you that have heard me chat before, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, a very predictable, boring guy. I'm trained by Jesuits. They insist that I have an outline, a game plan. They insist that I follow it. They also insist that I introduce pieces of history. So here's our game plan for the next uh, half hour or so. Uh, seven pieces, if you will. Uh, about 25 odd slides, and we'll just uh, hustle on through it. Kind of kick off with a couple of case studies, uh, two, two different case studies. So the first one, as you can read, here's a quite an elderly lady. She's alone. Perhaps she's widowed. Perhaps she's never been married. Her vision's not uh, tip-top, and she lives with a multitude of animals. In fact, the reason attention has been called to her is that the neighbors have reported her to the health department because of uh, persistent uh, smells. And when uh, the health department presents to inspect the residents, they find dozens of cats, dogs, and parrots. And in addition, some dead cats are found in the freezer. The house is deplorable. And on examination of this uh, senior gal, it's clear that she's been isolated a long time. She uh, describes numerous signs and symptoms consistent with depression. And her memory's poor. So we call in the cavalry. We call in helping agencies. They proceed carefully and slowly and gradually and gently they take time to develop rapport and they create a realistic plan of intervention over time, gradually with as much consent as this poor soul can give and lo and behold, good things happen as time passes she agrees to have her house clean top to bottom and, of course, as, as, we, as, we, as we have all seen, often this begins with folks coming in in biohazard suits. 
and doing a, a ceiling to floor fumigation. And furthermore, she agrees to keep in line with the law and maintain the city ordinance of no more than eight pets per residence. So a lovely outcome, a lovely outcome, in contrast to another case study. So here's a, a little younger gentleman. He's been widowed for a while, and he's been bunking down at his, at his buddy's house. And um, out of the blue, if you will, he starts to collect and hoard tools, parts, and equipment. He's going to rejuvenate the Ace Hardware Store economy. And time passes, and his uh, collection of these various and sundry items becomes so vast that living space gets very short. They, they sleep on chairs, as you can read. His adult children um, notice this with alarm, and they, they call the police. A multitude of agencies elbow Jackie in to, uh, to take over. However, they, they argue amongst themselves. There's no real organized plan. It's, it's an invasion, if you will. It's confrontational. And finally, the family becomes so upset that they just order up dumpsters and wholesale uh, discard all of this gentleman's items. And shortly thereafter, he explodes. He is rageful. He's anxious. He even appears to be delusional that these items had such great meaning to him. And he's ultimately arrested and now, instead of treatment, he'll meet the, the law and perhaps penal system. So, two very different case studies. So, the Jesuits insist that before you, you talk about a condition, you have to define it. So, there it is, hoarding. It's got a couple of places to highlight. It's the excessive collection. Now, at what point... Do we define excessive? Again, I think it's in the eye of the beholder. The excessive collection and retention of things or animals. And then here's the key piece. This is where the disease state sets in. Until this collection interferes with day-to-day -day function, be it at home, be it with family, be it occupationally, be it with friends, social life. And then, of course, as, as we got a hint from those dramatic pictures, as time passes, hoarding becomes a safety and health issue both publicly and privately, in contrast to collecting. So as I was creating this, for some random reason, I had the thought about Imelda Marcos. Do, do we remember Imelda Marcos? I think she was famous for having 10,000 pairs of shoes. But that was her collection. And I, I believe there are photos of it. It was organized in closets that were, were the size of houses. Uh, I think perhaps this vast collection of shoes was a symbol of her uh, power and authority. Others could admire it. So did Imelda Marcos hoard shoes or did she collect shoes? I'll, I'll let you all decide. But let's, let's take the microscope down one more notch. And I would mentioned at the very beginning hoarding, but what we're, we're truly going to be talking about is a specific syndrome. And it's, an, it's got a curious title, uh, the Diogenes Syndrome. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, Diogenes, wasn't that... The Greek guy who held a lantern and he was looking for truth, looking for an honest man. And in fact, Diogenes is, uh, is known for that. So what the heck does this have to do with hoarding and, uh, and the elderly? Well, as of 2011, this is a, a recognized syndrome. It's not yet a diagnosis. And it's got 
five specific components, and, and they're there. So it's a behavioral disorder, clearly. It's a problem with behavior. Of the elderly, typically 60 and above, although there are some middle-aged folks, it's rare, that manifest this. And there are the five components. Number one, extreme neglect of self. Number two, domestic squalor. I just love to say that word for some reason. Number three, social withdrawal slash refusal of help. Leave me alone. Number four, an utter disregard of concern, which to the casual observer is an appalling situation. To the, to the patient with Diogenes syndrome, it's, they're indifferent. Nothing wrong here. And then the last one, if nothing else, what you'll get today is a new word that you can throw out at the next cocktail party. The fifth component is solagomania, which is a tendency to hoard rubbish excessively. To hoard rubbish excessively. Now, Diogenes syndrome is, uh, has some other... Uh, monikers. Uh, if you look in the, the geriatric health literature, you'll sometimes see it described as senile breakdown or social breakdown, senile squalor syndrome, or the one that I like because I'm a simple guy is messy house syndrome, although I think that's a, a, a grave under under estimate. So there's our, our five components. Extreme self-neglect, domestic squalor, Social withdrawal, lack of concern, indifference, and hoarding rubbish. So I want you to put your thinking cap on and think about psychiatric illnesses that you've heard of or, or that you know of and, and where these behaviors are evident. And as you think about this, probably some of these psychiatric diagnoses will come to mind because they, compa they contain components of these five pieces that make up Diogenes syndrome. For example, depression. So when patients are sorely depressed, you know, they have low energy, uh, low interest, uh, they don't take care of themselves, they don't groom themselves as well as they usually did. They're kind of indifferent to what goes on around them. Dementia, folks with severe dementia, they, don't, they lack the judgment, you know, to make the right decisions. As the dementia progresses, their grooming often uh, deteriorates because they, they forget how to groom, if you will. They require a lot of assistance. There's a, a subtype of dementia, frontal lobe dementia. This presents initially not with memory loss, but with behavior changes, personality changes, dramatic changes in personality, um, loss of initiative, dramatic uh, manifestations of poor judgment. People with frontal lobe syndrome behave in public in dramatically different ways than they did before this, this illness struck them. Substance abusers, well, when, when folks are deep into an addiction, they just live to use. They live to drug, and often domestic squalor is, uh, is appalling. Now, most people, when we talk about hoarding, they immediately lock into obsessive compulsive disorder. But what do we know about OCD? Well, these are folks that have trouble with uh, time, money, and dirt, if you will. They're not generally messy. In fact, they're often exceedingly, excessively organized. Not a thing is out of place. Now, they have compulsive rituals. I mean, by definition, obsessive-compulsive disorder simply means we have obsessions, unwanted, intrusive thoughts that we can't shake, my hands are dirty, I'm contaminated. And these obsessions lead to compulsive behaviors. I can't resist washing my hands over and over and over again. Okay. So I think we think about OCD, but actually if you think about the larger picture, it's, it's rather different from hoarding. But there's that component there uh, in terms of, you know, rituals, if you will. Personality disorder. So one of the the pieces here was social withdrawal, okay? What do we know about folks with these specific, we call them cluster B personality disorders? These are folks who lifelong would really prefer not to be around people, 
Okay. Um, paranoid psychosis. So if I'm concerned that someone is going to harm me or hurt me or do me wrong, perhaps, again, I'll be withdrawn and I'll certainly refuse any help because maybe they're, they're actually trying to get the inside track on me and harm me. Okay. Delusional disorder. So a delusion is simply a false, firm, fixed belief. And, and when we look at folks with Diogenes syndrome, we say, what, what are they thinking? You know, is there some delusion here that if they throw away something, that they're throwing away a part of themselves? Well, what's going on here? And then the last one, just in addition, um, in folks that have mental retardation, again, grooming can be difficult. In cer certain types of MR, uh, we can see lots of ritualistic and compulsive be behaviors. And there's, there's even a, s a specific rare disease that falls under MR called prater willi syndrome, where these patients obsessively hoard food. So differential diagnosis in terms of psychiatric symptoms, these diagnoses share some of the components of Diogenes syndrome to varying extents. So there's lots of uh, intersecting diagnostic areas. But let's, let's go further. As of today, Diogenes syndrome is not a formal DSM-4 diagnosis. Now, DSM-4, as I'm sure most of you know, is the diagnostic and statistical manual that mental health clinicians use to specify criteria and make diagnosis because we can't treat anybody until we know what the diagnosis is. Diagnosis dictates treatment. So as of today, Diogenes syndrome is not a DSM-4 diagnosis. And, of course, that kind of leads to problem, too. If we don't have a rock-solid diagnosis, adult protective services generally doesn't have a distinct protocol. And they don't, per se, for Diogenes syndrome. These days, they kind of lump it under a dementing illness, although, as you're about to find out, half, Half of the folks with Diogenes syndrome are not demented. It's remarkable. So, how did it get this name? Because Diogenes is a Greek philosopher who was looking for truth. Okay? It's first described by Canadian doctors in the 60s. They looked at 72 patients, 60 to 92, and all of them were living in horrific, horrific conditions. All of them said, I really don't want anything to do with help or society in general. They were the ultimate loners. They also said, there's no problem here. Why are you in my home? And they actively resisted help. So four of those five components, remember our five components there. And when they looked at these people as closely as they would allow themselves to be looked at, fully half of them had a psychiatric diagnosis of some type. Generally, it's either depression, dementia, or substance abuse. But half, half of them did not have a psychiatric diagnosis. A great many of them were college graduates who held long-standing jobs. Remarkable. So this is the first notion of it. Didn't have the name Diogenes syndrome then. It was senile squalor. Okay? And then 10 years later, another case study <clears throat> this one, much larger. They had all the same components that you just saw. In addition, they were hoarding rubbish excessively. So there's their fifth component. And what they noticed in this group as they followed these people long term is after five years, half of them were dead. So there's a, a dramatic mortality attached to this. And again, replication. 50% of these poor souls, had no psychiatric diagnosis, no formal psychiatric diagnosis. It, it boggles the mind, doesn't it? So why Diogenes? So a little bit of history. My, the Jesuits will be very happy here. So Diogenes was a Greek philosopher. If you do the numbers, he lived to be 89 years old. Pretty remarkable, 400 years before Christ. Okay. And uh, if you get a chance, I, I urge you to read his biography. It's, it's fascinating. It's uh, it would make a great movie. But long story short, 
Kind of like St. Francis of Assisi. He rejected material possessions, wealth. He was actually the son of a banker. And he was the ultimate minimalist. He, uh, he found a large barrel that he turned sideways, and he lived in this barrel. Okay. Uh, his precepts, as you can read, uh, very natural life. He was dependent on nothing and no one, self-sufficient. He was utterly shameless, and I'm about to tell you a couple stories here in a minute. And he had contempt for the social organization. Now, think about Greek society in those days. The city-state and the social organization was highly prized. Now, what's fascinating about Diogenes is he did not hoard. He was the ultimate minimalist. He even took his drinking gourd and broke it because he elected to just drink by cupping his hands. And furthermore, he didn't eschew the company of others. Every day he went to the marketplace where he preached his philosophy. So very different from what we're talking about. But here's why the syndrome got the name. Number one, because of the way he lived. As I said, he slept in a barrel. He often begged. But here is, here is the, the, the wonder of this actually esteemed Greek philosopher. He engaged in very forbidden public habits. He would uh, use the bathroom in public. Uh, he had no trouble telling people off, and he actually was renowned. Maybe he was the, the first to display his displeasure by showing people his middle finger. So here's Diogenes, the cynic. Okay. Now, remarkable story. Uh, he was very well known. He's said to be the founder of cynical philosophy. And Alexander the Great actually journeyed to meet him. And Diogenes was residing in his barrel. Alexander came up to chat with him and, and at one point said, Is there anything I can do for you, Diogenes? And Diogenes said, Yes, you can stop blocking my sunlight. So kind of, just kind of gives you an idea of the sort of fellow he was. Okay? So we think that there's two subtypes of Diogenes syndrome. Primary, this is the lion's share. These are folks where there's an intention here, if you will. They, they are, are very direct and straightforward about how they're living and why they're living this way. And it's not related to psychiatric diagnosis. And then the smaller lion's share, secondary, these are folks in which there probably is clearly cognitive impairment. Perhaps their judgment is uh, dramatically skewed, and this is related to mental illness. So, some demographics, okay? Number one, this is an equal opportunity syndrome. Uh, males equal to females, although there were in, in early studies there looked to be a female preponderance. As time has passed, it's a 50-50 split. As I mentioned before, we can see it in younger folks, but tick Typically, this is in the 60 to 90 domain with the average age, as you can read, around 76. It is not rare. Now, you say, well, 5 out of 10,000 adults that are over 60, that doesn't sound like too much. That's actually 10 times greater than the rate of tuberculosis in seniors, that number there. So it's not particularly rare. Okay. And furthermore, it's probably... The tip of the iceberg. These folks, as I said, they refuse help. They kind of eschew society. They don't report. They don't step forward. It often comes very late in the game because of uh, neighbors. Okay? And then there looks to be some connection here, if you will. There's uh, homelessness. is, is called Diogenes Avia of the, of the road. And then uh, religious hermits is called Diogenes Syndrome or do, and some connection there. Uh, maybe the, the fellow we saw in Palo Alto might fit into the, the, the former there. So some risk factors. Well, I think risk factors clearly are: is the patient impaired cognitively? Is their judgment uh, now diminished? Okay, 
do they have, are we able to ascertain from family, friends, that this is a, a personality disorder at end stage, if you will? Do they have a depression? Okay. Other risk factors that aren't illness risk factors, living alone clearly puts people at risk. Um, folks that have low socioeconomic status, and then some medical conditions. And I think these probably, if nothing else, perhaps hip fracture impairs mobility and stroke perhaps impairs judgment. And then I neglected to put down substance abuse. These, these are sort of components that kind of push us more toward this suspicion of Diogenes syndrome. So treatment. Well, well before we can treat Diogenes syndrome, we, we now have to take just a moment and enter that, that wonderful arena that's available in this marvelous country where liberty is highly prized. And we have to think about medical legal issues. And in medicine, we are guided by a number of precepts, but, but two precepts are patient autonomy. In other words, whenever possible, the patient should be able to call the shots. The patient should be able to consent to treatment rather than have it rammed down their throat or forced upon them. Of course, beneficence, you know, a $10 word for we want to do good for the patient. So sometimes autonomy and beneficence clashes, okay? So I'm not going to answer these questions. I just want you to cogitate on them. But... The first order of business is, do mentally competent people have the right to neglect themselves? And this is, I think, a spectrum. There are shades of gray here. Okay? You could even dilute the question and say, is it possible that people that are bright and mentally competent will make foolish decisions and actions? Perhaps we could ask Congressman Weiner about this. Okay? And then the second piece that I think goes to beneficence is, do health authorities have the right to intervene? And, you know, I think some of that is, is very clear cut. They have the right to intervene if it's been deemed and determined and certified that this is a hazard to the public health. Is this going to spread a contagion? Okay. So, you know, as we enter the treatment part of this, uh, these issues are, are actually pretty large, and, and often they lead to, to uh, stalls in treatment. Ideally, in a perfect world, and I'm still waiting to, to find that perfect world, our guiding principle is care by consent. And remember our first case study, that 96-year-old gal, as time passed, gradual development and establishment of rapport, probably by one person, probably a very ingenious and persistent social worker, as time passed, she agreed to have her house clean and agreed to a cleaning plan and agreed, consented to abiding by regulations about keeping pets. So here's treatment. Well, since it's not a diagnosis, we don't have a recipe for treatment. It's a syndrome. And as, as we mentioned, the five components, you know, those are in different systems, aren't they? Kind of like what we call in geriatrics the geriatric giants, these syndromes, cognitive impairment, falls, incontinence, immobility, malnutrition. You know, those aren't specific diagnoses per se, but malnutrition might be. And they, they require kind of a multidimensional approach, a comprehensive approach to get people on higher ground. So in the same way, that's currently the approach to Diogenes syndrome, and it, and it kind of goes like this. Well, first off, let's do a, a very thorough assessment. Let's look at the patient medically, and, and if you have extreme self-neglect, you, you can bet all your money that there's going to be medical conditions evident here. There'll be ulcers, okay? There'll be fecal impaction. There'll be skin problems at minimum, okay? If we can, let's try and get a psychiatric history from either the patient or from family members or neighbors. Are they taking medications of any sort? Probably unlikely, but if they are, can we reconcile them? Since they're hoarders, maybe the prescription has a date on it from 1995. 
And then let's do a very careful review about how they function day to day. Can they see? Can they hear? Can they do activities of daily living? Can they dress themselves, toilet themselves, feed themselves, answer a phone, etc.? Okay? Let's get a social history. What's been this person's life? Okay? And then let's test them cognitively. This is a perfect world. We get these assessments and the patient agrees. Now, we've already set the stage. This isn't going to happen in a day or an hour. This is going to happen over time, piecemeal. Okay? And then we're going to treat this patient with Diogenes syndrome, ideally with a team. This isn't going to be the psychiatrist or the internist. This is going to be a team. And some team members, I think, have uh, the inside track, if you will, here. Hopefully, occupational therapy, maybe they can do the cognitive testing. Um, we certainly want to whistle up nutrition and dietary. So sure, maybe they're the quarterback here. Maybe they're the team captain. And geriatric medicine or geriatric psychiatry, they're consultants, consultants here. Okay. Some don'ts. We certainly want to avoid invasion. Remember our second case history? That gentleman was invaded, well-meaning, but it was a, a clumsy invasion. There was no coordination. And finally, he was invaded actually by his family. And if you invade, these folks in particular, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll show you who's in charge. Okay? You'll never hear from them again. They're going to lock down the household. They're going to reacquire their rubbish in a you know, a logarithmic fashion, and, and now we've etched in forevermore suspiciousness. And there's no trust. There's no therapeutic relationship. There's some evidence that when patients are involuntarily hospitalized, they do very poorly, double the mortality of age match controls. So some evidence that, you know, I think the, the short answer is, my God, this is awful. Let's just yank this person out of here. Let's put them in the hospital. It's not that simple. So, what's a clinician to do? Well, there's a lovely model to our, our quiet and humble neighbors just north of us, you know. The Canadian model, they've actually studied this, this Diogenes syndrome very carefully. They have a model, it's called gatekeepers. They train non-traditional refer referral sources, and you say, who are we talking about here? Mailmen, gas readers, grocery deliverers, bank tellers, the mom and pop pharmacist. They train them to look closely for seniors at risk. And as you notice, some of those professions are mobile. Okay, They're going to the patient. And they provide assessment. They're, they provide intervention. They've got a relationship, even though it's just giving them the mail, okay, or delivering the groceries, okay. So they're trained. And the way they approach patients with Diogenes syndrome is with a daycare and a community care management idea, not hospitalization, okay. What about medicines? You know, our country is uh, just an amazing place. We're a very pharmacocentric culture. If you've got a symptom, then by golly, the first thing I want is a pill for it. Well, medicines have been used anecdotally. There's, there was one case study. So SSRIs, these are the, the well-known antidepressants, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, trials of Paxil, trials of Luvox, primarily to try and dampen the hoarding, dampen the compulsive hoarding. It's pretty underwhelming. Okay, And sometimes trials of antipsychotics, particularly when these patients are, are very paranoid and delusional. But again, this is not the first, second, or third line of treatment. And then, of course, I think this is more from a public health viewpoint, home safety. You know, what can we do to prevent reaccumulation of clutter after the, the residence has been cleaned? Is there some routine cleaning we can put into place? Again, hopefully with consent of some sort. Can we organize a living space? So, I must tell you about the Collier brothers, famous brothers 
in New York City. In 1947, uh, they were in their 50s. They were notorious recluses that lived on Fifth Avenue in a three-story apartment building that they'd inherited from their wealthy parents. They had never married. They'd gone to school, and after college, they really rarely went out of their building, only went out at night. And in 1947, uh, someone phoned in an anonymous tip that one of the brothers was dead. So the authorities were summoned. They came to this brownstone, and when they opened the door, they could not get in the house. It took seven hours to create a pathway. Um, and they found one of the brothers who'd been dead about ten hours. And they began a frantic search for the other brother. As time passed, they suspected he'd killed his brother, and a manhunt ensued. Nationwide manhunt. This was a, a sensational issue in 1947. And ten days later, while they were cleaning this brownstone, they discovered the other brother. He was ten feet away from his first from, uh, from his uh, brother who had died. And he also was dead. He was crushed under a, a, uh, a trap that he'd made to block out intruders. From their house, they removed 130 tons. Now, let's do the math, okay? I think that's uh, a lot of tons. It's a lot of pounds, okay? 130 tons of rubbish, including 14 pianos, 25,000 books, a steam engine. The house was raised. It's a park now in New York. It's called Collier Park. And fire departments across the country often refer to homes that are rubbish laden as Collier Mansions. So a living space. So the last piece here. Let's see. Whoops. I think I might have one more slide left. So conclusions, quickly, and then we'll get to the questions. What can we conclude from this little review? For Diogenes syndrome, depression, dementia, substance abuse, alcoholism are clear risk factors. Always think about frontal lobe syndrome, and this is something you can identify by imaging. It's not a formal diagnosis, okay? We know where this syndrome lives. Older people, they're generally bright. They usually have successful work histories. But they are usually loners, and that's, again, an understatement. Some folks think maybe what this really is is the, the end stage of a personality disorder, or maybe it's the, the culmination of a perfect storm of somebody who's been very compulsive, so they do well in, in, uh, in work that likes compulsiveness. They've, they've not had relationships because they've always been paranoid. And then as they age, okay, and they're not able to form any relationships, we get this type of breakdown. The rule here is these folks do not want help. They don't see a need, and they're extremely withdrawn. So how shall I put this? Our work is cut out for us from second one, okay? Public hazards and private hazards, fire hazards, they're evident to the casual observer. Prognosis is poor. These folks are not going to be with us long. And management is challenging. I'm going to demoralize you at the end because they don't comply with treatment and they often don't come back for follow-up. So the key is for one person to gradually, carefully, gently build a relationship. So I'll stop here. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go here. So from... Danny in Alaska. I love that. I just love the fact that here we are in San Antonio. It's 105, and somebody in Alaska is, is looking in on us. Thank you. Has stress been implicated in hoarding? I have learned that a person's place in the social hierarchy can affect the stress hormones, causing stress in the body. And would hoarding also contribute to the stress? Terrific question. Terrific several questions. So I neglected to talk about biology here. So, you know, we've all used the term maybe to a friend or an acquaintance. You're quite a pack rat, aren't you? Okay. There's about 70 species of animals that hoard, and primarily they hoard food. Okay. 
It's very survival-based, you know. Squirrels store up nuts for the winter, okay? And, and clearly there's a biology to this. Uh, uh, we also know that there's some illnesses in human beings. Uh, for example, Parkinson's disease. The folks with Parkinson's disease can, out of the clear blue, very late in life, begin hoarding. There's some evidence from functional MRIs and, and neuroimaging PET scans that a particular part of the brain, the, the uh, takes me a while, I'm 59 now, the mesial prefrontal cortex might be where this type of behavior is triggered, if you will. Of course, you say, well, well what would the stress be in Diogenes syndrome? Well, maybe it's the stress from medical illnesses. I neglected to say that most of these folks that have Diogenes syndrome, high incidence of uh, high blood pressure, high incidence of uh, uh, anemia because they're generally not terribly well nourished, okay? High incidence of uh, some vascular disease. So, yes, it's, it's very clear now that, that stress, I mean, this is from Hans Selye's experiments with rats in the 50s where he would uh, electrify the floor randomly and uh, the rats would, uh, would get an electric shock, and stress hormones, in particular cortisol, would just climb off the roof. So uh, this is a, a puzzle that's being assembled. Uh, there's clearly a biology to this. We just don't have quite enough information. And, of course, then the, the question is why, why is it triggered at, at this point in life? Maybe it's from the stress of aging, if you will. So, second question from Jane. When you say this is not a diagnosis yet, when will it be considered a disease? Well, so, psychiatrists, we have this Bible. It's called the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, and we're in edition four. Okay? About every ten years, we decide to revamp it. Uh, it's the, uh, edition five will be out in 2013. And as I understand it, this Diogenes syndrome is under consideration as a potential diagnostic area. I don't know under what umbrella it will fall um, because I'm an Indian, not a chief. So from uh, Helen Flores, uh, subject, training of healthcare professionals. Is there any type of training for healthcare professionals non-medically being done? Uh, and I'll, I'll give you the answer I, I commonly give people. I, I plead ignorance. I don't know of any formal training. Uh, again, I think our, our neighbors and friends to the north are a few steps ahead of us. And as I indicated, they have this gatekeeper set up, which does have a formal training program, but I don't know the details. Ryan in Boise, Idaho, a beautiful city. Are there any signs in children that can predict someone being a hoarder late in life? Uh, heck of a question. Uh, again, I, I plead ignorance. I, I don't know. Maybe this is uh, one of these to be continued. Uh, I've got lots of, uh, of weak spots in Achilles heels, and uh, since I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, you've discovered one of them is I, I, I don't know a ton about children and adolescents and, and psychiatric illness. Should, uh, from Louise, should family members of hoarders get counseling themselves to assist their family member? Well, I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, so I'm always going to say uh, that I, I see no harm in it. I think just trying to, what's the, that old expression, understanding is the first step to healing. So I, I think that that's certainly... Uh, uh, you know, a very reasonable idea. And then le last question, would you see any patients benefiting from a support group? Actually, in my homework, uh, of course, these days, you know, uh, we, we don't go to the medical library anymore. We just go to Google or Wikipedia. You'll find a number of uh, support groups online for hoarding. I don't know if uh, they exist uh, in real time. I, I hope so. So 11.23, and I think we, we hit the, the, the timepiece. Although, I can fire one more slide if you got a minute. 
So let me see if we can advance this to the... There's one more slide buried here. Of course, the question is, why would anybody hoard anything? And you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a hoarder. I, I hoard books. I love books, okay? My wife has finally purchased me a Kindle, so now I can hoard books uh, ad infinitum, and it's only this big, so she's thrilled. So why, would, why, why do you hoard, okay? Well, first off, I think some simple things. You know, we're human creatures because we perceive the item as valuable. Although, think of our guy in Palo Alto. I'm not so sure I conceive of dirty, ripped plastic bags as valuable. Or we perceive of things as a source of security, a memento, an heirloom, okay? Um, if you look in my office, you'll see some stacks of paper, okay? Because... I'm a paper guy still, and I haven't made the, the full leap to being uh, electronic, okay? So I don't want to forget or lose items, eh? Now, now we're kind of getting into the next level. There's a need for some of us to collect things. I, I don't know if anybody asked Imelda Marcos, why do you have 10,000 pairs of shoes? You can certainly never wear them. And then the fourth one is probably maybe a, a little more important in this uh, era of confidentiality and privacy that if we throw something out then somebody will be able to take our identity but but let's drop it down a notch okay sentimental value so if I throw something that's sentimental away even if it's garbage then I'm actually throwing away a part of me okay decision making if I discard something maybe I've made a wrong decision and I don't want to be wrong okay Organizing. Well, I've got a piece of, I've got an item here, and I want to organize it, but right now the easiest place to do it is just in sight, so I'll just put it on top of the pile. Of course, that'll go on top, on top. Of it. And, you know, responsibility, okay? Uh, I have this item, and I don't want to see it wasted. Okay, maybe I'll use it in the near or distant future. And then the last one, maybe this is really the heart of the matter, control or perfection, okay? You know, here's something that I have control over, but if I discard it, it's now in the hands of somebody else. Say. So just food for thought about why, I guess I should just say why we...